What a beautiful song, holy, holy, holy. He is indeed holy. He's worthy of all that we have. So let's go ahead and get our Bibles and open them up to Acts chapter 11. I mean, the last handful of verses of this chapter, verses 27 through 30. And I'm, I'm just kind of blown away by how our catechism question and this message is going to go together quite well. Verse 27, Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, again, as the time comes and we open your word together, Lord, to Dive into it, to search it and know it, Lord. Believe it. Uh, we ask that the Spirit would come and teach and guide and direct and convict and edify and sanctify. Lord, that we wouldn't be flippant about this passage that's in front of us, as it's not one of the, the most popular in all the Bible. But Lord, it is your word. And so, Lord, let us take it seriously. Let us... Search the implications and seek to apply them to our lives even in today's modern world. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, our catechism question asks, what is the church? And to paraphrase it, it's the church are those called by God to be His people. Those, the ecclesia. It literally means the called out ones. Not everybody in the world is called out. As to be part of God's church. They are commanded to. And the gospel goes to all people. And they are to, all people are to repent and believe upon hearing it. But not all are part of the church, are they? So the church is not a building. The church is not brick and mortar or wood. The church is the people of God, the bride of Christ. That's what the church is. So then we need to ask, what should the church be doing? Or what should the church be about? I think we could give some pretty obvious answers to that. What should the church be about? First and foremost, uh, the gospel. How about that? Honoring God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Loving neighbor, loving one another, this kind of things. And so how does this stuff play out practically in the lives of the church and in the world throughout church history? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit. What we have in our passage today is an example of the church being the church. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing when the church is the church. What do you mean by that, preacher? Isn't the church always the church? No, not really. It means that when the church sees a need, they do not delegate that or pass that on to somebody else, the government, an organization, an entity. No. When the church is being the church, the church sees a need and does what she can to meet that need. As history continues, the church has pretty much handed all charity, benevolence, education, and so many more things off to mainly the government. And that's very sad. It's sad because first, that is not what God has called the church to do. And secondly, when the church was handling these things, when the church was in charge of Benevolence and charity and orphans and widows and education. All those things were accompanied by the gospel. 
And now that those things have been forfeited by the church, they are no longer accompanied by the gospel. And matter of fact, most times the gospel is not welcomed where these things are being done. The church used to be the pillar of education. The church used to be the primary supporters of charity and benevolence. The church used to be on the front lines when disaster struck. The church used to be the ones who brought in orphans and made sure widows were always taken care of. In our passage today, we see a coming disaster. Something that will impact every single person in this region. And it will be the church that steps up to the plate during this difficult time. For the past few weeks, we have seen in our study of Acts, God moving and working in the lives of the Gentiles. And no doubt he's still going to be doing that. We saw that with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Saw that with Peter and Cornelius. And last week, we saw it with the church in Antioch. So God has worked in the lives of the Gentiles. And now we're, our focus is going to... Yes, we're still in the Gentiles, but we're also going to go back to what the church in Jerusalem is doing. And what the church in Antioch is doing. So God has worked. And then the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to Antioch to investigate uh, what God has been doing there. And while Barnabas is going to Antioch, he has the idea, maybe I should find Saul. Right? We haven't heard from Saul since his conversion several chapters ago. Now he's being brought back up. And for an entire year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught many people. That's how last week's passage ended. And also, last week's passage ended with this. It concluded that in Antioch, there the disciples were first called Christians. It's the first time that word has been used. It's only used three times in the New Testament. It's used twice in the book of Acts and once in 1 Peter. And the word Christian was not used flippantly like it is today. So many people call themselves a Christian and they know nothing of God in His Word. I know that sounds judgmental. I'm not trying to sound judgmental. I'm just trying to speak the truth here. I guess it was Friday... I went to a local establishment here in town. And the Jehovah's Witnesses were out front with all their literature, passing it out and all that good stuff. And y'all know me, I can't just ignore it. So I go to my truck and I have tracks for Jehovah's Witnesses. And I attempt to give them my literature. Of course, they would not accept it. I said, I'm just doing the same thing y'all are, except for one big difference. What I'm giving you contains nothing but truth. And I said, I'm not here to belittle you or to have a debate or an argument or anything like that. I'm here because I love you and you are spreading a false gospel. And so we got, she, they were very sweet. They did talk with me for a little bit. But it really comes down to the biggest, the biggest thing in the Christian faith. And that is who is Jesus Christ? See, they do not believe in the deity of Jesus. They do not believe that Jesus is God incarnate. They believe that he is just simple, was simply a man. Yes, he would, they'll say he was the son of God, but that's as far as they'll take it. She even said, we don't worship Jesus. I said, but the watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses call themselves Christians. Christians worship and follow Jesus Christ. That's where the name came from. And I said, so call yourself something else. Because you're not a Christian. You have to believe in the deity of Christ to be a Christian. Now that's just one small example, but there, we could talk about this all day long. There's so many people that call themselves Christian that are not following Jesus Christ. That's what the word means. A follower of Jesus Christ. And not some 
Jesus we had created in our imagination. No, the Jesus of the Bible. That's what it means. So when they used this word, throughout most of church history, it wasn't used flippantly. It meant something. The focus for the past few weeks has been on the move of God beyond Jerusalem into the lives of the Gentiles. Again, we're kind of transitioning here at the end of chapter 11 and chapter 12. The focus is going to be primarily again on the church in Jerusalem. And in the structure of the church, very briefly, and the troubles the church will soon be facing. And we're going to see how the church responds. So let's look at it, verses 27 and 28. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Do you know how to tell a true prophet from a false prophet? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Yet yeah, wait and see. It did what Agabus foretell here? Did it come to pass? Well, yes, it did, just so you know. We'll talk about when in a minute. But another group that would call themselves Christians has their entire belief system based on the thoughts of their prophet who foretold countless and countless false prophecies. Yet it's one of the biggest religious organizations in America. It's spreading in other parts of the world too now. So in the first part of this section it says, Now in these days... And in the last part of that section, in verse 28, it says the days of Claudius. So at first it says in these days, and then it defines what those days were at the end, the days of Claudius. What days were these? Well, Claudius ruled the Roman Empire from 41 to 54 AD. It is during this time that the prophet Agabus prophesied that a great famine would take place. This famine would not be localized to any just specific portion of the greater region, but it would be widespread. As a matter of fact, when it says over all the world, a more literal reading of that would be the word widespread. Meaning it would not just be it just in Jerusalem or just in Egypt or just in Syria. It would impact all of the region. All these places. So Agabus prophesied that this will happen, but did it? Yes, it did. In AD 45, the Nile River flooded and ruined the grain harvest that this entire region was dependent upon for food. And of course, this brought widespread famine. So Agabus prophesied that would happen. It does happen. Obviously, this is a great disaster. This is one of those things we call a natural disaster, right? So how is the church going to respond to that or to this? So that's the problem. A great natural disaster. People's lives will be affected. People will literally starve to death. You see, we don't really have a category in our mind today of famine. We live in America, right? Listen, I don't mean this in an ugly way, but we have overweight homeless people in America. Okay, we don't know what hungry is. Okay? <clears throat> but, man, during this time and in many places of the world today, famine is a real danger that millions of people have had to face and deal with. It's terrifying. We get cranky if we don't eat lunch till 12.05. These people are just hoping. Why do you think Jesus prayed? Give us this day our daily bread. Because daily bread was not a guarantee back then. 
if you had a little piece of a fish and a little piece of bread, you had a pretty good day. So again, when famine is coming, it is devastating. And somebody has to step up to help. Let's see who it is. So the disciples determined. That's When it says disciples here, that is referring to all followers of Jesus. Okay? Not just the, the twelve apostles. The disciples determined that everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. So Judea is the, the larger area that contains Jerusalem. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So how does the church respond? Does the church say, you know what? Uh, the Roman government has a program. And in this program, all you got to do, you got to fill out the form online, okay? And it takes three business days. And then perhaps they'll give you a gift card where you can go get some groceries. I know that sounds utter ridiculous, but hey, that's what the church is doing today. Most of the churches. We are delegating things that belong to us to people that have no desire to honor God. No, the church steps up. The disciples determine that everyone, by, according to their means, their ability, send relief to the brothers living in Judea. So what are they saying? Hey, it's time for the church to step up and bring some relief. But this, these two words, send relief, may stick out to some of you that are familiar with disaster relief, right? Because what, what is their big phrase? Sin relief. One of the things I love about disaster relief is they have seen the, the problem that the church has delegated to other entities, other organizations, and these other organizations, yeah, they may do a good job of mudding out someone's home or cutting up a tree, but they're not doing it while they're sharing the gospel at a time when people desperately need to hear it. So that's the beautiful thing about disaster relief. It sees the need. And guess what? It's done through the local church. It is Christians who go and bring relief to people. Just like they did right here in Judea. That's what Christians should be about. Especially when it comes to things like uh, someone has just lost their home. They're feeling hopeless and lost. They may, may even ask the question, and many do ask the question, why would God do this? Or why would God allow this? And it's those times where somebody, all they need to hear is, I don't know. But I know He's good and He loves you. And we're here to help however we can. But the world's not going to do that. These world organizations, when they're down there, and they come across somebody who's lost everything they have, and they ask that same question, why would God allow this? To the worldly organizations, that's an opportunity for them to discount or discredit God. And they will do that. You see, we have to stop delegating things to the world. How about when it comes to taking care of orphans? That too has been delegated to the world. One of the saddest things that we have is fatherlessness in our country. Fatherlessness will ruin a nation faster than anything else. But we live in a fallen world, and so fatherlessness is going to happen. And again, it used to be the church that goes and finds the fatherless. We're commanded in the scriptures, Isaiah 117. Care for the fatherless and the widows. The church is commanded to do this. And what have we done? We've delegated it to the government. 
Or what has been the results of that? A foster care system that can't keep up. And it's not no fault of their own. They're trying their best. But there's just not simply enough people. Why? Because the church is not being the church. How about when it comes to education? The church used to be the pinnacle and pillar of education. Do you know where the term Sunday school came from? It was school on Sunday. Yeah, it was all based on a biblical worldview and the gospel. But that's where that came from, Sunday school. The church used to be the local school of the community. And guess what we've done with that? Oh, government, we don't want this anymore. Could you do this from now on? And what's been, what has been the results of that? Pretty good, you say, or not? When the church is commanded by God to do things, and we take the easy way out and say, you know what? We're going to pass this on to somebody else. Disaster happens. Because that was not God's plan. Same thing when it comes to benevolence and charity. Did you know that in, I think it's in Oregon, they are attempting to make it illegal for Christians to foster and adopt? I think it's Oregon. I may, maybe in a, it's one of them crazy states. <laughs> They're making it. You know who the number one people group for fostering and adoption is in the world? Christians. And they are trying to make it illegal for the church to be the church. Hey, I'm sorry, government. Do you know? Who is originally commanded to take care of these orphans and these fatherless kids? The church. You're outside of your lane. You are crazy and you are nuts. I think that's I think the church just needs to tell the government, hey, you're nuts. You are you're outside of your lane. You are making trying to make decisions that are well beyond your pay grade. I don't want to be overly political here, but you know what the two jobs the government has is to protect its citizens and uphold justice. That's it. That's all the government has been commanded by God to do. And yet they're involved in every single part of most people's lives. Because the church has become sissified. And handed things over to them. This ancient church though in Jerusalem. And Antioch. Which is a new church plant by the way. It's not very old. Decide that everyone according to their ability. To send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Why do you think. We place such an emphasis on missions. And we, I guarantee you, that's what I love about our church here. If there's a need in the church, and the church knows about it, we're going to make sure that need is met. That's, I've been here almost seven years. And every time the church has had a need, a true need, God has blessed us and the church has met that need. Now there might be a few things we want that we don't get. Right? We learned that lesson when we were kids. Right? Most of us. I need this. No, you don't. You want that. But every time there's been a need, God has been gracious and we've met that need. And so, everyone in the church, according to their ability according to what God has given them 
is to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And look at verse 3. And they did that. They did so. So they send relief. Again, we're not, uh, we don't have great details on what that relief looked like, but it would have been money, it would have been resources, it would have been food, things like that, help, helping hands. And listen, verse 30, they did so sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Do you know what elders are in the Bible? Really old people? No. What are elders in the scriptures? They're pastors. They're the overseers of the church. And listen, this is one church. Okay? They're sending the relief to the, to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. So we defined earlier what the church is. We've seen what the church should be doing. How is a church to be structured? Is it to be a bunch of people and one fella up here calling all the shots? No. Every single New Testament church, every church that we have now, every church that will be planted through Paul's missionary journeys, have a plurality of elders appointed to oversee that church. Did you know this? A plurality of pastors. It doesn't mean they all have the same function, or they're all preaching pastors, or they're all lead pastors, or whatever adjective we want to add in front of pastor. But healthy churches have a plurality of pastors the church can look to for wisdom and guidance and direction. That's what a healthy church, that's the way a healthy church is structured. Now, on the flip side, did they say, okay, we have a hunger, famine crisis going on over here. So I think what we need to do is form a special committee. And on this special committee, we need three men, three women, two children, and a squirrel. And this committee by lay people, not called by God to lead the church, is to be in charge of making sure everybody's fed. I know that my sarcasm on that was heavy. I apologize for that. But see what has happened. Is the church has lost its mind. Most churches now. When I say I'm talking about mostly Baptist churches. That's our context. Have a congregation. One pastor. A board of deacons who function as elders of the church. They're not elders. They're deacons. And then 37 committees to actually make all the decisions for the church. That has never been God's design for the church. Just like it was never God's design of the church to delegate, taking care of orphans, feeding the poor, make sure widows have everything they need. Right? God has a particular structure and particular commands on purpose because He wants things to flow in the, the way He wants them to flow, not in the way we want them to flow. And so you have the church being called out by God. That is the group of people called by God to be His. And then you have the commands of what the church should be doing. Yeah, first and foremost, we're about Christ and His gospel. Taking this gospel to the nations. And one of the ways we do that is through charity, benevolence, and being there when people are in need. So we've gotten rid of all those things. Not only have we gotten rid of all those things, we've gotten rid of these beautiful scriptural examples of local churches that have a plurality of elders and pastors they can look to. See, see what I'm saying? 
Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? We have to be careful that we are not doing church our way. This is his church. We're going to do it his way. It is to be structured how he deems it to be structured. And we have New Testament example after New Testament example. And church history is full of biblical examples of the structure of the church. It is to function the way God has said it should function. We are to worship him in spirit and truth. Many of you, have you ever heard of the RPW? That's the regulative principle of worship. The regulative principle of worship is just to believe that we do not do anything in our Lord's Day worship services that we don't have a scriptural support or scriptural example of. So, you're not ever on a Lord's Day Sunday morning, you're going to see Zeb up here juggling chainsaws. You're not going to see Kevin ride a little pony down here, although that would be amazing. <laughs> you know, we're not going to put on a show. There's a lot of churches putting on shows. Because they're so focused and not on reaching the world with the gospel of Christ. But pleasing the world by looking just like them. That's not what the church is supposed to be about. Here's another thing that's somewhat controversial. For an unbeliever, a biblical, God honoring, gospel filled church service for the unbeliever should be very uncomfortable. And what do I mean by that? Not uncomfortable because they're not welcome. Not uncomfortable because we are singling anyone out. But because our messages and everything we are doing is so enriched with the scriptures that it causes them to be uncomfortable. Still following me? Again. If we want to right the ship. If we want our nation and the world to turn around. To do an about face. If we want. The gospel to be prevalent again in western civilization. Then the church will once again have to return to being the church. We have to stop delegating things. And some of the th those things we have delegated. We need to take back. One of the things, reasons I wanted to have a local ministries conference that we're having later this month. Is because we have some of these ministries here in Athens that are done through churches. We're going to have Isaiah 117 house come. The Abundant Life Pregnancy Resource Center is going to come. And the food pantry will be here. You know what those are? The food pantry is mostly Christians seeing the need that other pe people need food. And we're the ones stepping up to provide that. They're not all Baptists. They're not all. It doesn't matter. We see the need and it's mostly Christians that are fulfilling that need. When it comes to Abundant Life Pregnancy Resource Center. Again, who are, who's the group of people in the world that's saying life has value and dignity and worth and that it begins at conception? It's Christians that are doing that. Who sees that fatherlessness is the greatest Okay, lostness is the greatest, but right under that is fatherlessness. Is the greatest problem in the world today. It's Christians that see that. And so, 
again, the reason I wanted to have this conference is to promote these ministries because we have to get back to Christians being Christians. We have to get back to a place where the church is being the church. We're not entrusting the world to care for the fatherless and to care for widows. If they want to, that's fine. But we're the ones that have been commanded to do so. We need to get back to the place where we understand and believe that life begins at conception. Did you know as soon as life sparks, right at conception, all the DNA that makes you who you are is present at that moment? Only God can do something like that. There's only Christians that have this message and believe this message. We need to be consistent with this message. And how about those who are hungry? Don't have much. Perhaps we're a widow or a widower and have no means of income. Who do you think sees our neighbor hungry and wants to do something about it? It's Christians. And that's why we have places like the food pantry. We have to stop trusting the government is going to do what's best for people. As old Ronald Reagan said, the scariest words a man can hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Even when they do good, guys, it's not accompanied with the gospel. And that's the difference. When disaster relief is sent out, they don't just carry their chainsaws with them. They carry the gospel as well. With Isaiah 117 house, when a child is removed from their home, and they need to be loved on and given things. They're not just showing up with cookies and a backpack by themselves. No, the gospel is going with them. When a young lady walks into Abundant Life Pregnancy Resource Center, not knowing what to do because she just found out she's pregnant, you have people there not just with diapers and wipes and the care, physical care she needs, but they're also there with the gospel. When people show up because so they can't afford groceries. By the way, that's becoming a more and more common thing today. It's not just some non-perishable food items they're going to receive. They're going to see smiling faces from godly people that also want to share the gospel with them. And that's what I mean by the church being the church. We need more people being involved in these things. That's all I got for us this morning. So let's go ahead and stand and pray together. pray and then as always we'll have a time where you can respond to the word are you doing what you need to be doing are you doing your part I'm not asking if you're doing it perfectly because we're all going to fall short of that let me put it this way are you just drifting Comfortably through this Christian life. Not really ever getting your hands dirty or your feet tired. Or are you actually being the hands and feet of Jesus? Because um, that's what he's calling us to do. 
He's not called us to an easy life. He's called us to a life of service and sacrifice and giving and to bear one another's burdens. Have you bore anyone else's burdens since God saved you? Are you too consumed with selfism? Where you can only focus on yourself so you could never possibly see the need someone else has. Have you gotten really good at delegating things to other people? We all have to answer these things honestly. We all need to confess to God where we've fallen short and ask Him for the grace to bring you to the place where you need to be. So if that's you, I'd like to pray with you this morning. I'll be down front at the end of this prayer. If you'd like to talk or pray, I'd be happy to do that with you. Of course, you can respond right where you are as well. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, what a, a heavy topic this morning, Lord. It's not one that I pray any of us are taking lightly. Lord, I pray that we would ask ourselves those questions and we would answer them honestly, not trying to fool ourselves and certainly not attempting to fool you. Lord, and in all those places where we fall short, we do ask for the grace to, for you to bring us where we ought to be. Lord, I pray we're not just trying to coast through life Lord, I pray we're not just trying to take it easy. Never want to get our hands dirty. Never want to give and sacrifice our time, our resources. Lord, I pray if that is the case, though, that the Spirit would come and convict us of that sin. And you would plant our feet on the right path. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.